My name is Dr. Sonieli Lugo Ruiz, and I am a pediatric endocrinologist from the Morris Children's Hospital in Orlando, Florida. Today, I will take a moment to talk to you about the most important work tools used in pediatric endocrinology. We will take a brief moment to discuss different measurement tools like growth charts and measuring tape. If you want more information about growth velocity and midparental height calculation, please refer to one of my previous videos for growth. I will also touch base on the importance of anthropomorphic measurements, as this is a crucial measurement to plot genetic conditions, malformations, and other alterations in growth. I will also discuss the Bone Age X-ray book, the use of an orchidometer, and the use of an exophthalmometer. There are two main growth charts, the ones made by the CDC or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which are present in this slide. The other ones are from the World Health Organization, or WHO. The CDC growth charts are divided by gender and focus on the population of the United States. The WHO growth charts are divided by gender, but they also take into account many other ethnicities and consider groups that have used breastfeeding as their major source. Other special charts are available and should be used for different children, such as trisomy 21 and Turner syndrome. Please keep in mind that as children grow, they start to ambulate, and this becomes very challenging as some children will not allow for proper measurements. The important thing is to be patient when we are taking these measurements, otherwise it might seem like the kid is shrinking. There are also changes in growth charts according to age. For example, you can see in this picture that the CDC growth chart is tracking from 0 to 36 months or from 0 to 3 years. Now the second chart is also from the CDC website, but it goes and measures from years 2 to 20 years. Sometimes you can see a patient that is doing well at 1 percentile in the first chart, but then transitions to the second chart and changes percentile. This is very important as we, as endocrinologists, need to measure growth velocity and should take into account the actual measurement, not the chart percentile. Another important factor to remember is that premature babies need to be plotted per their corrected gestational age. It is very common to mistaken that a patient has short stature or deceleration in growth because the measurement is only done considering their chronological age. The same thing should also be applied when we are thinking of their milestones. Here, we take a brief moment to talk about measurements in pediatric endocrinology. We measure head circumference, chest circumference, limbs, length or height, and then we also check genitalia. Two measurements that are very important are the stretch penile length, or SPL, and the anogenital distance, or AGD. If you can see in here, there are different measurements and should be taken in cases when we're talking about micropenis, growth hormone deficiency, and especially in disorders of sexual differentiation, also known as CSC. If you want to find more information about this, please look for medical sources to properly formulate your answers. I will not be talking a little bit more about genitalia in this lecture as I don't want to get it flagged in YouTube. Another important tool mentioned in the general pediatric boards and also used in pediatric endocrinology is the upper to lower body segments. This is taken into consideration that normal linear growth includes the upper body initially taking most of the total length and then transitioning into a ratio that's close to one as an adult. There are multiple measurements that are done in terms of proportion and this touches a little bit of the genetics world that is linked with endocrinology. Conditions like Marfan syndrome, Klein factor, acromegaly, achondroplasia, arachnodactyly, Soto syndrome, will show alterations in the upper and lower segment ratios. Other measurements for limbs can show other congenital conditions. I will be taking about the most common conditions in the next talk. The bone age x-ray is an estimation of the maturity of a child's skeletal age 
and correlates it with chronological age. We can see in here the different bones that composed the pan, and you can take this into account by comparing it using the Brulich and Pyle method or the Tanner Whitehouse method. Now, a bone age that's advanced or delayed in a reading is not diagnostic of a pathological growth. However, this is an incredible tool as this is a longitudinal study that was performed from 1931 till 1942 and has been unable to be repeated again. It provides a measurement that allows to understand what are the two standard deviations or what is expected in 95% of the population of a certain gender at a certain age. We also talked today about an orchidometer. This medical instrument was introduced in the 1960s and it measures testicular size. As you can see the picture in the right, the first three little balls or one, two, three are just taking into account the amount of mLs or cc's that should be expected in a prepubertal child. As you get into the tanner staging, you will see that testicular size increases until it reaches tanner 5 or adulthood, which is the equivalent of 20 to 25 mLs. Keep in mind that testes are not symmetric so they can have slight variations. But the important tool of an orchidometer is that you can correlate blood work with clinical findings. Last but not least, the exophthalmometer is an incredible measurement in patients that have Graves' disease or that suffer from hyperthyroidism. The Lute exophthalmometer is found to your left, and this one is more friendly in order to carry it and it's able to address only one eye, where the Harther ver version to the right can address both eyes at the same time. This is a great tool to see if there's any protrusion of eyes, as well as it will change Graves' disease treatment depending on eye findings. I would like to say thank you again for joining me in this lecture, and I will be bringing new lectures of pediatric endocrinology interest. This lecture was last updated November of 2020.